Hello and welcome to iBuzz. I'm your host, Nasheen Bukhari, bringing you the latest and most exciting entertainment news. In today's episode, we will discuss the slow decline of American and British sitcom, followed by a movie review on Iceman. First things first, let me quickly take you to the top stories of the day. Horror flick, old, tops North America box office. Black Widow slides down to number three. Sitcoms face a slow decline as Netflix cancels four comedy shows. Ariana Grande debuts in The Voice with amazing Camp Out promo. Kristen Stewart's Diana films Spencer competing for top prize at Venice Film Festival. And Britney Spears files to remove her father as conservator of her estate. Netflix is clearing the decks, cancelling four of its original comedy series. Country Comfort, The Crew, Mr. Iglesias and Bonding will not return for additional seasons on the streamer. With this alarming news, the question rises, are the British and American sitcoms becoming a thing of past? To have further discussion on the subject, we are joined by producer and director Giulio Maria Martino. Giulio, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. So, Giulio, television has changed a lot in recent years as streaming has completely shaken up how people consume entertainment and now the changes may be prompting the demise of what was once a staple of broadcast network, the sitcom. How would you like to comment on that? Um, I think it's probably a bit premature to say mm -hmm. that the sitcom is, you know, dying and dead. I think there may be other reasons more immediate for why sitcoms are faring uh, this way at the moment. I think we've been obviously, you know, everybody's been talking about this, but we're in a very, very unusual time mm -hmm. when audiences have been accessing uh, content in a different way. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the pandemic, really. And I think what appeals about the sitcom is that it's about daily life. It's about yes. the qu quotidian matters. And we haven't been living daily lives recently. And mm -hmm. so all of a sudden, our focus has been on on other things. And sitcoms have found it, I think, difficult to speak to that. If you're mm -hmm. watching a sitcom, it's about, you know, your life as you go to work, who you may meet in a cafe or a bar. Yeah. And sitcoms are generally sort of based around those environments or indeed, you know, at work around the water cooler. And suddenly mm -hmm. those things aren't available to most people around the world, especially mm -hmm. sort of England and America, where these sitcoms are based. Yes. And so sitcoms suddenly aren't speaking to people in the same way. And mm -hmm. I think that may be the immediate reason why sitcoms generally aren't being viewed, although there are examples where they are being successful, I think. Right. Uh, there is still a hope and place for sitcoms on cable networks, but sadly, with the advent of streaming services, a large number of viewers have turned away from the network. So does this mean that the broadcast business model is equally responsible for the decline of sitcoms? Well, no, I think what the broadcast model offers that's different is that the sitcoms are paced uh, weekly and you don't get to binge them all in one go. And it's interesting what Apple streaming have done with Ted Lasso, which is a sitcom mm -hmm. that's bucked the trend People are talking about it a lot. It's very popular and has kind of a different view on life than a, a lot of other sitcoms. But they're releasing it weekly again, much like Marvel are releasing their shows. Mm -hmm. And I think actually the broadcast model works better for sitcoms. I think binging 10 episodes of a sitcom one after the other doesn't quite work in the same way because you're not going to be laughing mm -hmm. uh, at episode 10 in the same way that you were laughing at episode one. I think, you know, that you can still be following a story mm -hmm. in that way, but I think sort of still finding jokes funny after binging 10 episodes one after the other over a weekend doesn't really work for a sitcom. And I think streaming platforms will start and have started to adapt uh, to the broadcast model in that way as, as they go on. Mm -hmm. And do you really think that Netflix or other streaming networks would advertise and spend more money on an original sitcom like The Big Show Show when it already has some of the biggest sitcoms on offer? Yeah, I think sitcoms are very, you know, cheap to produce at the ground level and mm -hmm. something like The Office when it began in Great Britain or some of the other many sitcoms that have come out of Great Britain or something like in the US like 
Always Sunny in Philadelphia. These shows were produced in their first seasons for very, very little money. And mm -hmm. I think people are always going to be trying to create these situ these uh, works. I think it's just inevitable that, mm -hmm. you know, young, interesting, funny people will come up with these shows and there'll be a sudden race to pick them up and, uh, and show them. And what people find is what Netflix will find is that when these shows are popular, people mm -hmm. will stream them again and again and again, word of mouth, and they'll become blockbusters, much like Friends did and Seinfeld did in uh, and Cheers did in Frasier in earlier eras. So I think it's it's very premature to mm -hmm. think that Netflix, um, you know, uh, Disney and the other streaming services, Amazon mm -hmm. and, and Apple will will forego this. I don't think they will ultimately. Right. And Julio, we cannot say that the viewership for comedy series has ended, but the demand has definitely declined. Do you think it is because of the monotonous subjects that these sitcoms have, uh, you know, uh, opted for? Well, comedy is based on repetition and it's based on people repeating the same thing mm -hmm. again and again yeah. and, and, and uh, you know, hitting the same wall again and again. And that becomes funny and, hum mm -hmm. and humor comes out of that repetition. And then mm -hmm. it comes out of the the inversion of that repetition. And mm -hmm. so sitcom, a sitcom does need to have a certain monotony about it in order for it to work. You know, Cheers was based around this idea that the same losers gathered yeah. in the bar each week, just as Seinfeld was, you know, the, the, the same group of, you know, losers effectively, like us, you know, s s you know, lamented about their miserable lives. And I, I think that really the, the problem has been over the last 18 months Mm -hmm. is that people's sort of daily life has been completely, you know, disrupted. And people don't want to be experiencing, I think, a pandemic sitcom. Mm -hmm. People don't want to be experiencing a locked in sitcom. They might do. I think as we go out of this, that might actually mm -hmm. be something that happens. It would be interesting to see. But people, I think, have been actually, you know, deciding to watch fantasy mm -hmm. and science fiction and horror, things that take them away from their daily lives, whereas sitcoms really are about daily life and they're about, you know, mm. the funny but miserable experiences we have in daily life. And so I think this uh, this idea of the sitcom, mm -hmm. now that we're beginning, you know, to sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic, we think, mm. will mean that, you know, people will start coming out with ideas again. And I think these will be taken up by both broadcast networks and streaming networks. Right. Uh, Julio, sometimes even the repeated subject works, but the number of sitcoms cancelled in the past two years is staggering. It has clearly become a race of survival now, even the most successful sitcoms still being aired owe a lot of their success and longevity, uh, longevity to the power of streaming. Now, in your opinion, does the responsibility also lie on the traditional presentation of comedy series, the format that it, these comedy uh, sitcoms are recorded in? Studios, you know, sometimes in front of live audiences, uh, because this is not the case with shows like IT Crowd and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah, I think the sitcom needs to reinvent itself again, and it does that with every generation. And we're probably at a mm -hmm. stage now where, you know, having had sort of like, you know, revolutions of previous eras and sort of things like, you mm -hmm. know, The Office and the IT Crowd, mm -hmm. um, things like All of a Sun in Philadelphia, that we're now all waiting for you know, something new. I think something like Ted Lasso on Apple streaming, as I was mentioned, is possibly a way forward. And interestingly, that is a completely uncynical show. It's actually a feel good show about, you know, you know, people not being horrible to each other. Mm -hmm. And it may be the kind of thing that people want at the moment. But I think that actually, you know, you're quite right. We're in a period where no one seems to be able to find the magic key mm -hmm. and people will be looking for the next generation of sitcom creators, which will definitely happen, mm -hmm. I'm certain about that. Um, because it's a timeless format that's been going on since, you know, the days of Moliere and mm -hmm. French drama and, 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 you know, Roman drama before that. You know, it's not something that's even new to television, but the idea of situational comedy is, is thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. And so it, it will come back again. And I think that it just requires people to sort of break the mold mm -hmm. and refashion it. It doesn't, it, you know, it, it, it isn't dead forever, I'm certain of that. Right, and do you think that things have to change in terms of the financial model for comedy series to find some balance between networks and studios? Um, well, I'm not a financial expert, but I would mm -hmm. say that, you know, these revolutions almost always happen mm -hmm. when people don't obsess about spending money 
and actually find cheap solutions to things. And often the, the, the revolutions in sitcoms are created mm -hmm. by sort of young people working at the margins of the industry that find a cheap, clever way to create something new. And it's mm -hmm. usually made among people that know each other and friends, and they're not great big corporate sort of machines that are put together by corporations. Mm -hmm. This is especially true of sitcoms because we're talking about something that's always very small, mm -hmm. effectively low budget one way or the other, and is actually a series of jokes between friends that are developed into a sort of, you know, a plot line of story. And that's true of Cheers. It's true of Seinfeld mm -hmm. and then Curb Your Enthusiasm. It's true of All the Sun in Philadelphia. All these sitcoms are really sort of actually very low budget, simple ideas. And I think that the, the broadcast networks and streaming networks will be, you know, hungrily mm -hmm. looking out for the new sort of, you know, magic key to that, you know, to the next mm -hmm. generation of that stuff. So. Right. And with some of the shows being permanently canceled at Netflix, the situation of survival of these sitcoms has become pretty, uh, pretty tight. Uh, do you think it's a matter of brand as well? Because we still see popular shows like Friends, The Big Bang Theory and New Girl being massively viewed. Yeah, well, I think this is again to do with the pandemic. People want the familiar and they mm -hmm. want nostalgia. And another thing people have been wallowing in, you know, mm -hmm. is nostalgia. The Friends reunion was obviously really, really talked about. And what was it? It was just a bunch of people sitting around talking about yeah. old times. And I think that actually, you know, for the last 18 months, mm -hmm. you know, people don't really want to sort of like throw themselves to an mm -hmm. in an into an uncomfortable new environment generally. They want to think about the past. They want to remind themselves about when they used to go to the coffee shop or to mm -hmm. the bar, or they used to hang out with friends at work. And that's actually what people, you know, will have been doing. You know, they want to log on and watch, you know, 10 episodes of Friends while they make, while they're cooking. They're probably mm -hmm. not even completely watching it all the time, but it's actually more of a comfort blanket than it is actually a new dramatic experience. As I say, I think as we move out of the pandemic, assuming mm -hmm. that is actually what's happening here, I think new stuff will start to emerge again. Mm -hmm. And after all these sitcoms finishing up, what will happen to one of television's most popular genres, in your opinion? Will we start seeing a change in the medium? Yeah, I think we'll see we'll see a change in, 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 in the genre of the sitcom because that's, as I've said, what has to happen each time. There'll be a mm -hmm. rebirth and a regeneration and people will start coming out with new formats and new mm -hmm. ideas. And I think, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, sitcoms have all really been about You know, mm -hmm. uh, the ugly side of people or the sneaky side of people mm -hmm. being, you know, being sneaky with each other and yeah. being slightly unpleasant to each other. And that's been quite fun to watch. But I think actually what may happen is that, you know, in the example of Ted Lasso, sitcoms yeah. or at least other sitcom makers, now that they've seen that be successful and it's really, really being talked about quite a lot, they'll mm -hmm. try to find actually sort of maybe a more gentler, nicer side to things. I don't know whether that will catch on beyond that sitcom or not, but I mm -hmm. bet you people will try and do that. And maybe for a time that, that'll work, we'll see. Right, and Julio, it, it's, uh, it, it has also become a matter of, just just a minute, Jitala? Okay, okay, right, so, okay. So Julio, it has also become a matter of need of time. Do you think that sitcoms are still need of the time Because we're watching a lot of comedy movies coming in. Um, so do you think that it is quite worthy to spend time and budget on making these sitcoms? As we have seen that, uh, you know, creating sequels of certain movies has also becoming a thing of, it, it, it is also becoming a thing of past. So do you think that this is a need of time or if it is not, then, you know, um, there should be a focus on creating comedy movies rather than creating uh, this genre? Yeah, I think actually the thing that'll keep sitcoms alive is actually mm -hmm. at their base, they're cheap to produce. What costs money are famous stars like Kevin James mm -hmm. and, you know, for example, the people that voice The Simpsons and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who are commanding sort of millions of dollars per episode. And they're actually, but at, at its base, they're really, really cheap to make. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, you know, networks will find a way of keeping them going mm -hmm. because there's really sort of magic sort of area they end up in. When you have a hundred episodes mm -hmm. of a sitcom, mm -hmm. that can be sold all around the world. Right. And so those shows are being in syndication again and again and again, and they're repackaged mm -hmm. and sold with other hundreds of shows of sitcoms all around the world. 
and they're very sort of, you know, financially valuable. And I think networks will, once mm -hmm. they've taken a breather, look at that again. They'll start mm -hmm. looking around for who's creating interesting stuff and they'll jump on it because it's actually really expensive to make a movie mm -hmm. because you've got to check your changing locations for the whole film. A sitcom has three or four basic locations and they're studio bound one way or the other. Um, you know, so I think that I think it, it, it's almost bound to survive. If, if, if the networks turn away from it, which mm -hmm. you, you've suggested that might happen, then people will be creating it and putting it up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. People will realize that it's actually really popular. And all that will have happened mm -hmm. is the networks will have lost some sort of power, at which point they'll buy it and they'll try and co-opt it back in. So I think it'll continue anyway, um, mm -hmm. especially now that the sort of the, the, the means of productions mm -hmm. half in the hands of the creator anyway. I think the networks will unavoidably be back on the sitcom sooner or later. Right, right. Julio, great discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. That was Julio Maria Martino discussing the future of sitcoms. And now moving to other story details of the day. New M. Night Shyamalan horror thriller Old aged to perfection at the top of the North American box office in its debut weekend, taking in $16.9 million. The movie, which is about a family that becomes trapped on a beach where they begin to age, stars Gail Garcia Bernal and Vicky Creeps and beats out the weekend's second highest moneymaker, Snake Eyes, by more than $3 million. Paramount's latest G.I. Joe installment, also in its debut weekend, earned $13.4 million, recounting the origin, the origin story of its character Snake Eyes' involvement with the famed squad. In third place was Disney's latest Marvel edition, Black Widow, starring Scarlett Johansson, which took in $11.6 million. American singer Ariana Grande seemed excited to be part of America's singing competition, The Voice, as she has recently made her debut in the campy season 21. NBC has released a promo of Ariana Grande joining her fellow coaches on the show. Apart from the 28-year-old singer, the contest's music coaches include American singers Blake Sheldon, John Legend and Kelly Clarkson. The new season of the singing contest will begin on September 20 this year. Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog, Pedro Almodovar's Parallel Mothers, and Kristen Stewart's turn as Princess Diana and Spencer are among the titles vying for the top prize at the year's Venice Film Festival, which runs September 1st. Spencer by Chilean director Pablo Lorraine, film centers on a weekend in the early 1990s when Diana decided to separate from Prince Charles. These movies are among 21 films in the main competition. Britney Spears' newly hired lawyer filed a petition seeking to remove the singer's father, Jamie Spears, as conservator of her estate. The petition filed in Los Angeles Superior Court by lawyer Matthew Rosengart seeks to expel her father as conservator and replace him with Jason Rubin. The petition calls it an objectively intelligent preference to nominate a highly qualified professional fiduciary in this circumstance. That is it from the newsroom. We will be right back after a quick short break. Stay tuned to find out more. Welcome back. It's time to review the 2012 release Iceman. Richard Kuklinski, a contract kill killer, kills innumerable people for pleasure and personal gain. Previously unaware of his violent side, his family abandons him and moves away when he is arrested. To review the movie, we are joined by film critic Matt Capon. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. So Matt, this dramatization of the famous serial killer Iceman, uh, Richard Kuklinski, sends shivers down your spies. How would you like to comment on the storyline? Well, it's originally it's originally based on well, so it's based on a real story. Richard mm -hmm. Kuklinski was a notorious uh, mafia contract yeah. killer, and the movie was built around the documentary, which was released ten years before the mm -hmm. film, The Iceman Confesses. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very interesting ta tale, really. Yeah. So, how do you see the pace of the events unfolding one after another? Does it feel like everything is happening abruptly? 
I oh, the film is a bit of a collision. It's very it's very mm -hmm. blunt. It's very very direct. Very very direct. Mm -hmm. um, at points, it's very difficult to actually keep track with the passage of time, with mm -hmm. how the film progresses, with Richard Kuklinski's life mm -hmm. and how he meets his wife, Winona Ryder. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little bit difficult to really grasp as um, as a member of the audience. Really, mm -hmm. it's not the easiest of films to watch. Right. The motivation and characterization of Richard is depicted as someone with anger issues and uncontrollable killing urge. Do you think this message was delivered effortlessly or there were some plot holes that you felt while watching the movie? Michael Shannon carries this film. If it was a lesser actor, mm -hmm. this film would be absolutely dreadful. But you can tell that he's based his portrayal on the documentary 10 years before. And actually, mm -hmm. he's gone on record as saying he, his inflections and the way that he talks is actually based on the original interview that Richard Kuklinski did. It is difficult to try and keep, keep pace with, though, because there's so much going mm -hmm. on, because they're trying to fit in such a large and complex, complex story. And as I said, were it not for the really strong portrayal of Kuklinski by Michael Shannon and the supporting cast, this mm -hmm. film would be, to be quite direct, total garbage. Mm -hmm. And the casting was done amazingly. Michael Shannon, Winona Ryder, Chris Evans, Ray Liotta, James Franco, uh, David Trimmer and many others indeed made it a star-studded movie. How would you comment on that? The cast, is in, the cast is incredible, but if we were to scratch a little bit mm -hmm. deeper below the surface, I think some of the cast really are phoning in their performances. Ray Liotta is an incredible mm -hmm. actor, but he doesn't really seem to care much in this film. You don't really empathise with the journey that he's going on as this big, as this big crime boss who really brings Kuklinski into the underworld. Similarly, Chris Evans' um, character as that fellow contract killer, that fellow assassin, mm -hmm. I, I don't really emote with him um, towards, towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really feel anything for him when, um, when he gets killed. Hmm. But sadly, with even such, uh, like you said, with even such star-studded cast, the movie could not make more than $4 million on box office, while the, the filmmakers were pretty much hopeful that because of the story, because it's a true story, and normally what happens with crime stories is that if they're taken um, from a novel or they're you know based on some true story, they make it to the top, top 10 at least. But this film could not make it. It's probably uh, rated 6.4 on IMDb. Yes, and to be honest, I think IMDb are being generous there. <laughs> um, really, what you've got with um, The Iceman is mm -hmm. it's a dry run through a much better film which was released a couple of years ago, The Irishman. Mm -hmm. The Irishman attempts yeah. a very similar story and a very similar tale, but it does it much, much better. Mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese's direction and Robert De Niro's performance is incredibly captivating. Mm -hmm. As I said, Michael Shannon makes this film watchable, but it should be it should really draw you into a really cold-blooded killer's story, but it really doesn't. Uh -huh. uh, and there was this unnecessary character, which given to James Franco, which of course he, he did justice with his character, but the character itself did not do justice with uh, James Franco. Uh, what is your take on that? That was to be blunt, I think it was quite a cynical uh, mm -hmm. cameo. Um, I don't think James Franco's character did anything for the story other than mm -hmm. really try to show that Kuklinski was a cold-blooded killer, that he really did have mm -hmm. an emotional disconnect which made him perfect for the job. Mm -hmm. But you watch it and you know what's going to happen. You know the end that James Franco's character is going to meet but you mm -hmm. come away from it really not caring. It's what happens afterwards um, when Franco's been killed, mm -hmm. um, where you actually find a little bit more of a reason to in invest in the story. And that really is a common theme throughout the film. Hmm. And according to some critics, after watching this movie, Michael Shannon should get at least an Academy Award for his performance in this movie, because this guy can act and you, you lose the person and totally see the characters that he portrays. What is your take on that? Oh, completely. Michael Shannon is an actor that doesn't uh, receive the plaudits he mm -hmm. so obviously deserves. I mean, his exchange with Stephen Dorff 
mm. in the film I thought was incredible was incredibly incredibly magnetic mm. and the idea that that these issues actually might be running in the family that Kuklinski's brother was yeah. just as unhinged um, and you're drawn into that really brief exchange between Kuklinski and his brother and you want to know more you want to know more about that backstory mm. and it's Shannon that carries Shannon that carries it that Iceman glare mm -hmm. is really something that I, that I will always remember this film for mm -hmm. about Chris Evans character that was probably the first time he played a villain uh, in his career and he absolutely nailed it according to some critics what are your thoughts on his character as Richard's partner in crime? Yes, it's true. Chris Evans, this was Chris Evans' first attempt at, play, at playing a villain, and mm -hmm. he does seem to have fun to begin with, but mm -hmm. it's not a character that I think suits Chris Evans. Um, I'm sure he had fun, and it, mm -hmm. you can tell through the film that he seems like he's enjoying himself, mm -hmm. but when he meets his grisly end, I really didn't care. Um, I wasn't invested. I wasn't invested in, um, in his in his story. It was always carried by Michael Shannon, and mm -hmm. Michael Shannon yeah. really draws out the best from Chris Evans. It doesn't go the other way. Right. So, moment of truth. How would you rate the movie according to your own IMDb? <laughs> My own IMDb <laughs> rating for this. I think I would. I would have to say with Michael Shannon, with mm -hmm. Winona Ryder, with Winona yeah. Ryder, who does a very good job as the wife that is oblivious yes. to what her husband is doing as a day job. Mm -hmm. I think out of out of ten it gets a very solid five. It, it right. were it not for the were it not for the um cast, were it not uh -huh. for Michael Shannon or Winona Ryder, mm -hmm. it would be sitting at a very measly three. Right. Matt, thank you very much indeed. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks a lot. That was Matt Capon reviewing Iceman. And that is it from today's episode. We hope you liked it. Don't forget to share your feedback on the social media link mentioned down below. We'll see you next time. Until then, take care and goodbye.